Are you curious about how you might have a more fulfilling work life? Well, you're not alone. In fact, the numbers show us that many of us want more fulfilling work lives. I'm Susan Mee Creadon, your host. And as a finance director, ops director and leadership coach, who has lived and worked in many countries, I've met people who love what they do and people who don't. People who bring their full selves to work and people who won't. But one thing that I've learned that is common to us all is that we are all unique and have unique experiences and perspectives. So join me and my guests as we place a lens on the people side of work life and explore ways to let your uniqueness shine through by sharing insights, stories, strategies and techniques to inspire your work life. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Caroline Payton. Caroline, you are most welcome to Life Beyond the Numbers. Thank you very much, Susan. So, Caroline, a couple of years ago, I read a book called Gut, the inside story of our body's most underrated organ. And it's written by Yulia Enders. And it gave me a completely different picture of my gut. And what to look out for and think about. But it's not something we talk about often, is it? Our gut health. No, not at all. It, well, we don't see it, do we? It's not visible to us. And then unless we actually have specific digestive symptoms, we sort of think, oh, that's all fine. You know, you wouldn't think about it. But as I know, as, as many of us are beginning to learn today, just how important what is going on in our gut and the gut health is important to our overall health today. We're learning so much all the time about this. I find it fascinating. So what is going on in our gut? <laughs> well, it's, it, well, in very simplistic terms, one of the main things is the fact that we are home to trillions literally trillions of bacteria, some viruses, maybe some parasites, maybe some yeast and other fungi. 10 times the number of these microbes as there are cells in our body, 10 times the genetic influence, maybe more to do with the genes in our body. And they're talking to other, we're learning about other microbial um, organisms in the body, which we're learning more about where they are and they're sending out messages and communicating. So in very simple terms, we've got this environment that's full of bacteria, mostly, which sounds a bit scary, but they very much are either dictating and controlling our health and or contributing to disease. Lots of research around that now. So we've got that aspect. And then when we think about the gut beyond just the microbes and based on that really is to do with our digestion, the gut the gut walls, the mucosal lining, this thing that we often call leaky gut, which sounds quite funny. So many aspects to it, influencing health, inflammatory conditions. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So if most of us don't ever think about our gut and I'm going about my day normally, what might trigger me to start thinking about my gut or what should I look out for? The digestive symptoms without me having to go into what they may be are first and foremost, the first thing to think about because they're telling you that something is not right. You know, we put up with bloating and let's say a little bit of wind and maybe some burping. We know we go, oh, that, that's normal. But in many ways, it's not really normal. There's something out of whack and there's something that's not quite right. So the digestive symptoms would be the first thing to think about other than that it is difficult you might have a little bit of a rash going on that might be telling you there's something wrong with elimination toxicity is coming through to the skin it's an eliminatory organ really just about anything today anything that's inflammatory condition going on could be headaches for women hormonal imbalances you know there's so many aspects autoimmune conditions brain fog things going on in the brain maybe a slightly low mood they can all have I'm not saying in it's just due to that but they could have links back to what's going on in the gut wow and what about stress 
and the gut, Caroline. Because obviously, like a lot of people listening to this are at work, say, or maybe not right now while they're listening, but you are yeah. going to work day on day and we put up an incredible amount of stress in our lives. We do. We're all stressed. And I say to my girl, you can't take away stress. We can, we can find ways to try and minimise stress. There are ways to try and manage it a little bit better. But yes, stress research has shown most definitely impacts not only perhaps inflammation itself within the gut, but upsetting this balance of the good and the not so good bacteria that resides there and cr- can create this sense of what we call dysbiosis, this imbalance that starts to occur in this microbial population because we're not all good bacteria and it's not all bad bacteria there is always an element of the two that's going on what we want to try and do is have it weighted heavily more in the in the sense of good so yeah stress is really really important to bear in mind when we think about the gut Mm. and I think about we're all different as well so are our guts different (laughs) Oh, that's, that's really weird. weird. Yeah, no. Well, well, yeah, the micro, you know, let's just talk about the microbiome, you know, the research that's been done with different populations and cultures around the world will show very, very different types of microbial strains and species that are living there. And a lot of research to show when we follow a very typical Western diet that may be processed foods, a lot of cheaper fats, maybe lacking a lot of vegetables and fiber, how it's changing the the diversity towards possibly more pathogenic strains of bacteria. When we look at the Mediterranean diet, lots of oily fish, maybe even a little bit of red wine's okay, lots of vegetables, you know, it's completely different. And then you've got people who follow ketogenic diets. I'm sure some of your listeners may be following a high fat diet and that will change the microbial balance as well so what you're eating very much influences what our microbial in, um, population is going to be yeah. okay and then what about intolerances so if we have unique guts we will have unique intolerances well, yeah. So when we think about food intolerances, many clients come to me going, well, I think I've got a food intolerance. I always take that back first and foremost to look at people's digestive capability, what's going on at the start. So if we're not able to adequately break down our food well, we're left with partially broken down food that finds its way down through the gut. We've got different strains of bacteria that start to feed off food that shouldn't be there because by then food shouldn't be food. You should only have the waste fiber that's left so food intolerances first and foremost are very often likely to be linked to poor digestive capability but it can be as we are all unique that some people really can't tolerate certain types of food they are intolerant that's completely different to an allergy an allergy has that automatic reaction in the body can be potentially very dangerous for some individuals, but intolerances tend to be less obvious, a lot more subtle. Bacterial strains have an influence. So when we think about dairy and people think of lactose intolerance, you know, we are the only mammals to consume dairy beyond infancy, yet we can normally tolerate a little bit. Now, very often in our Western diets, we eat too much dairy. So that puts an additional burden on our ability to digest it. But also we've got certain bacterial strains that help to break down lactose, this milk sugar. So if you're lacking some of those beneficial strains of bacteria, that can also have an influence on something that's coming across as a food intolerance. Hmm, interesting. And I just imagine that we all have something. (laughs) Everybody has, because there is almost no ideal diet or optimal no. way of living it's trial and error it is and I and I think I've been talking about this a bit more recently with others around listening to your body trying to get a little bit more in tune with our bodies like we say well, our lives are so busy rushing around doing different things things to worry about that's going on in the world we don't often connect properly and stop and think about what's going on so no we're all going to have different things that suit us more than others there is no one ideal diet many people choose to be vegan now and that may suit some but it won't suit others and it, it's really important to try and tune in a little bit to what we think suits us it can be difficult to work out 
ourselves. And that's where sometimes you think you're intolerant to certain foods or you don't think you're thriving or particularly well on certain types of diets. It's quite a good idea to keep a little food reaction diary. Or if you then notice, oh, I think it could be, let's just pick, pick gluten. I don't like to pick on poor old gluten all the time, <laughs> but let's just pick gluten. Take it out of your diet, but you've got to know exactly where it is in foods and everywhere. And take out your diet for a month. Do you feel any better? If you don't feel any different, it's not likely to be that. Maybe you only notice if you reintroduce it as well. Yeah, that it can be. Yeah. yeah. I'm a great believer that most people can eat most foods in moderation. The problem tends to happen is that we don't tend to eat that way. You know, we like the wheat, we tend to have a lot of wheat based foods in our diet, whether it's in the bread and the toast or the cereal or the pasta or the odd biscuit here and there. The wheat creeps in in various guises. And so when I stop and analyze clients' food diaries, I can pick all these out, which isn't obvious until you stop and look at it. So often we have too much of an overload of a food, whereas if we just scaled it right back, and ate it more in moderation, and we ate more diverse types of foods in our diet, we might be fine. We talked about gluten and wheat and finding wheat in all of these places. But what about fruits and vegetables? <laughs> okay, so let's face it here, you know, we should all be eating a very great amount of and diverse amounts of vegetables i'll just leave fruit to one side for a moment the vegetables are providing vitamins minerals things that we call phytonutrients that are these plant-based compounds chemicals that, that convey their health benefits to us as well the fiber in them feeding the gut bacteria let's bring it back to that as well helping the elimination in so many ways ways we do need it fruit we need a little bit of fruit again vitamins and minerals we need to watch fruit because it's very sugary some fruits are more sugary than others so when we think about five a day many people think oh i'll, I'll focus more on the fruit because fruit is sweet so we naturally want to choose it but actually we should only have a little bit of fruit a day and eat far more vegetables and in an ideal world, we'd have 10 a day. <gasps> That's just like, oh, how would we ever achieve it? But you can include herbs and spices and nuts and seeds. Doesn't just have to be your piece of broccoli that's included. They are plant-based foods. It's the plant-based aspect that's important. Yeah, being so plant-based, I'm not saying you've got to be vegan or vegetarian, but we need more of a plant base to our diet. Yeah. Then is wheat not a plant? As a grain. <laughs> grains are a little bit different. Uh, some of these grains are very modern. They're very different to those that were grown many, many years ago. They really came about in the more industrial age. You know, if you go right back to when we were hung together, we didn't eat grains. They weren't part of our staple diet. And what we don't appreciate is the fact that our body genetically and, our, and in terms of digestion hasn't really changed. It hasn't really changed and it's had to tolerate and cope with all these different types of more modern foods and processed foods that we throw at it. And, it, and our bodies are amazing. They will do our, their best to cope. But sometimes if we push it a little bit too far, it will start to try and tell us <laughs> that it's not so happy. We've talked about digestion and the right types of food and all of that. What about actually eating? <laughs> like the process of eating because so many people will rush their lunch for example yes yeah absolutely one of my favorite phrases that I used to say to my daughters when they were young and rushing food is your stomach doesn't have teeth so when <laughs> when we swallow food the first place it goes to very quickly and it's very high up up in our body is actually our stomach so yes you know digestion starts with the sight and smell of food when you're cooking food thinking about food when we can think about something nice to the saliva increases doesn't it the sight and smell of food is the very first stage of digestion it sends a message to the brain that sends a message to the stomach the food is coming and it needs to be ready it needs to be releasing digestive secretions gastric acid in the stomach and pepsin and enzyme to break down proteins then the chewing action chewing again the saliva contains an enzyme called salivary amylase helps to start breaking down um, more of the carbohydrate plant-based foods so all of these then send further messages down to the stomach about we need digestive secretions it all has a knock-on effect all the way down 
the chain, if you like. So if you're stressed and trying to eat, it's it's like um like no go. Yes, again, your body's amazing or do its best. But the fight or flight reaction, which is the stress mode, the opposite side of that is rest and digest. That's the parasympathetic. And we're supposed to be in rest and digest for obvious reasons in order to digest our food. When we're stressed, the body turns off or hinders non-essential functions. So when we're stressed and we're trying to eat, the body can't cope very well with that. And so this thing about food intolerances could be you're stressed when you're trying to eat, you're eating in a rush, you're not chewing your food well, your body's not prepared for it, it's not able to adequately release digestive secretions. Then the body sort of sends out some messages and then you think, oh, actually, I'm perhaps I'm intolerant to that. If we stripped it right back and just tried to eat in as relaxed a way as possible, it would really help. Wow, that's... I think that's something that no, I, I won't say nobody, but that people would never think about. No, because we just, because our bodies are amazing. So we don't really know. And the body, as I said, we'll always just try and adjust and compensate and cope. But as we get older, particularly as you start to hit our 40s and beyond, that's when the body really starts to go, hold on a moment. I've been putting up with this for too long now. Can you start listening to me for a moment? I need some extra help now. Thank you very much. I really do. So and that's when often people come to me. Is that not always, but you know, as we're getting that little bit older and more symptoms are appearing more and more. But yeah, it's really important. You can't take stress away completely, but we can do our best to try and go, okay, I'm going to try and pause I'm going to sit at a table I'm going to try and do some deep breathing I'm going to consciously bring myself back to the fact it's what I call mindful eating I'm about to start an eating meal I'm not going to look at my phone I'm not going to be watching tv because they're distractions I don't need right now so anything you can do to calm everything down when you're about to eat a meal is so helpful and savoring your food I think is can help you with that if you think yeah, spices and herbs I've just written a post recently a blog post about like, a week or so ago about more herbs less salt we don't need to put salt on our food but you know, just start using more herbs wonderful things they're plants yeah great nutritional status and and so many like antibacterial antiviral anti-inflammatory properties to different herbs and yes the flavors can help to stimulate there are other foods that can help to stimulate digestion they're known as bitters so things like chicory and rocket you know you'll often notice in some societies they might have a small bowl of salad or something alongside the main meal those foods those bitter type foods they actually help to stimulate digestive secretions mm. I meant to actually savor the experience right, of okay. as well yeah, can help absolutely. you to eat more mindfully yes yeah absolutely you know just we should be enjoying our food I think we've We've almost lost that, haven't we? People are worried about their weight or could be digestive symptoms and they're losing track of what to eat. And again, we're all rushing. At one time, we all sat down as a family, didn't we, to eat. And having lovely food to eat is so important. I love eating. We should love eating. We should really enjoy it. We don't, if we love cooking, that's great. I say to people, you don't have to cook fancy, complex meals. Adding herbs and things to meals can make them really tasty. I've actually been growing, um, well, I've been trying to take more care of looking after my herb garden right outside my back window. And I've grown all sorts of different things this year. And I'll just chop a few and sprinkle them over a salad. It was brilliant. Dill and, well, it might just be parsley, but it could be dill or all sorts of different things. It's just lovely. Yeah, I did... Uh coriander and basil for the last few years but this year I've added dill sage mint what else parsley and I have like and, and I love them as well because yeah. if you look after them they keep growing they keep growing I know they do yeah keep them handy keep them if you haven't got a garden you can just grow a few in pots on a window you say they're not difficult I think basil's a little bit more difficult at times isn't yeah. it pretty hardy and they grow well in an English climate they do they definitely do so Caroline 
we never even said what you do <laughs> <laughs> we, we went straight into this yes well, no but it's interesting because you haven't always been working with the gut have you no I haven't no so um I'm in my 50s now I after university I was very much corporate role and you know I was going to progress that corporate career which I did for 20 years I was in big FTSE company middle management role very stressful gets to a stage where you think I'm not really sure this is for me that's what I did anyway very disillusioned with that you know you put up with the stress and trying to give it your best and just got to the point where I felt I that's not really what I want to do in the future. I certainly wanted to work, but I didn't, what, couldn't see that as my future. And I just describe it as a light bulb moment for me, really, in terms of, I kept thinking about what else I was going to do. And I'd always loved reading about nutrition. I'd pick up magazines. I'd always be reading about that and get latest information for health. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to retrain. I'm going to start studying nutrition. So I had five-year-old twin girls. I was working a sort of part-time role in corporate, never really properly part-time, and started studying nutritional therapy. And then I got the opportunity to leave my corporate role, finish my studies, and then complete my training first as a nutritional therapist, and then as a naturopath. Then I did iridology, then I did wellbeing coaching, then I decided I ought to stop doing any more training because <laughs> you can, I think many people will, will relate to the fact when you move into this type of profession, therapy type role, holistic, you, you start learning, you love learning more and more. <laughs> Absolutely. You mentioned iridology. What's that? So iridology is the study of the coloured part of the eye, the iris. Nerve fibres extend out to from the brain and reflect in the eye and when you see eyes under magnification you see all the different fibers in the eyes the different colors represent different things and we see different constitutional types in the eyes a bit like people who understand anything about reflexology where feet re relate to different parts the studies that have been done with iridology over the last couple of hundred years show how it relates to different parts of the body so you can see the digestive zone and what's going on there and all the other parts and where the brain is and where the pancreas is and the liver and the thyroid and you can see all of that so I like to use that when I see clients face to face I don't see all my clients face to face now but for an initial consultation it's nice if I can because then I can use my camera take pictures of the eyes and it helps me get a sense of an a person's inherent strengths and weaknesses areas that we might want to focus on it can give you a little bit about personality types and emotional responses that sometimes I say to my clients and I go yeah that's really me <laughs> so that's what iridology is it's practiced very much in greek doctors german doctors russian doctors very big in other parts of the world not recognized very much here in the uk so there aren't a huge amount of practitioners here but it's not a sort of therapy on its own it's a more of a diagnostic tool mm. And it's fascinating because at the beginning of the conversation, you talked about how the gut is something we don't see and then maybe we don't think about it. But the eyes are giving you it's the window. They, well, they say it's the window to our soul and can be the window to our health. Yes. Yeah, so we are born. A lot of people say, well, those markings change. And I'll say, well, actually, no, the markings, some markings can, but most of you were born with. And it doesn't mean that what you see is what's going to happen. But actually, sometimes you can see things and then that can help you potentially avoid worse health symptoms coming along if you know how to take care of things. But I can very much see digestive insufficiencies in eyes or the stress and how it impacts on digestion. You can see that in the eyes you can see leaky gut in the eyes. You can potentially see parasites in the eyes. I'm not saying it's set in stone, but there are things that I might go, mm, that's something I'd like to just explore more of, you know, yeah. Wow, that is a kind of amazing. I mean, again, and reflecting back on what you've said about how the body is amazing. Yeah, yeah it really is, yeah. And, and presumably somewhere along the line, like somebody realized this, that's also amazing. I know, 
I know it is amazing. Yeah. And how they then started studying it. You've got to admire people who committed a lot of their time and their life to, to this. And then we're beginning to map what they saw in the eyes to their patients is amazing. Then obviously that's been tweaked a little bit over the years, but not significantly, actually. It's really interesting. It is. And so the other thing I think about it in nutrition is what role has exercise got? Exercise and diet. We hear a lot about if you exercise, then. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It'll be healthier. Yes, you know, and exercise is important. We all need to move, but it's about movement. The more we learn about this, it is about the movement that's important. You can't undo 10 hours of sitting in a chair by going off and doing a spinning class and think I'm really healthy as a result of that because you've just had 10 hours potentially of inactivity and not moving much. Research has shown how this has an impact on what we call metabolic diseases. So insulin resistance, diabetes, maybe cardiovascular disease because we're just sitting and sedentary and we weren't designed to do that so yes I'm very much desk based in what I do but it's trying to remember to get up walk around walk up and down the stairs a little bit go and stretch your legs try and do something rather than just sitting down a lot and exercise doesn't have to be that spinning class it doesn't lead to weight loss it really does not lead to weight loss the more people exercise the more it can lead to more of an inflammatory state in the body because it can release more cortisol, depending on the type of exercise you do. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you should stop all of it, but we need a bit more of a balance in our lives, doing different things. And don't underestimate the power of just going for a really good walk in the fresh air. I'm a naturopath as well, so you've got to think holistically about the whole body and the mind and the body as well. It's all, all relevant, all related. So yeah, exercise is important, but it's about the movement and the types of exercise you do rather than just, yeah, I've gone spinning today and that's, that's great. And that's all I need to worry about. And even movement, just from the perspective of shifting a mood, movement is, is so helpful for anything. Like even me waving my arms here, changes the energy of the tone of my voice absolutely and can change our posture and the way when we're at a desk we're sort of slouching a bit and it can open everything up it's really important for moving the lymphatic system around the body so the lymphatic system runs parallel really with the circulatory system it takes waste away from our tissues and our cells has to drain it back into the bloodstream to be eliminated from the body but it hasn't got a pump hasn't got a heart can get really stagnant we need that movement to get it all moving around the body. Something again, that's invisible, but is important and relevant. And for some clients, it's difficult depending on their health conditions. They may not be able to move very much. Even just sitting outside in the fresh air, let's not say it's sunshine, we don't get a lot of it these days, but just being outside, get some fresh air, that alone can lift your spirits and make you feel better and even just move if you move the upper body just moving your shoulders and your arms around or moving your ankles and moving your legs up and down if you're sitting you know it's all movement and your neck from side to side and just trying to keep everything loose it is all movement it's all important And if you're in an office, so many of us are office bound and we are sitting, whether we're in a meeting at our own desk, there must be different ways of working that doesn't. There are, you know, and something that I keep saying I'm going to do and I haven't done yet is a standing desk. What I really want is a desk that goes up and down, actually. That's what I really want. I need to invest in lots of research around that. It doesn't always have to be the moving, but even the standing is really important. Again, from this perspective of utilizing glucose and insulin resistance, diabetes, there's you know, a lot of research around that. That would be so helpful, wouldn't it? To be able to stand when you're working and spend some time standing when you're on a call or do something like that or writing then you might want to sit down a little bit but or you can get those special they're not a chair but those things you kneel on they can be really good for your posture can't they rather than just sitting I've tried to get a more of an ergonomical type chair but you know there are times I just 
yeah I need that standing desk that's what I need yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and and I suppose if you're in an office you can always just have a walk around every now and then or go outside at lunchtime as well and eat slowly <laughs> Eat slowly, yes. And this thing about movement, it might be well, you've only got 10 minutes. It's not, well, there's only 10 minutes. There's no point. Actually, there's every point if you've only got 10 minutes to just, even if it's walk around your garden, short walk down the road and back, there's every point in utilising that 10 minutes in a in a productive way like that. And take the stairs. Take the stairs. The yeah. When I'm in London, not very often these days, but I always walk up those escalators. I like walking down so much. I'm always worried I'm going to fall downstairs. It's a really good thing. But but walking up those, and some of them are very, very long, <laughs> but walking up those escalators and don't just stand on them is a really good thing to do. Yes. So don't try not to use a lift unless you're on the 20th floor or something, or, or you get off a floor early and you walk the last one. And that's kind of simple, really. You isn't it? Stop, stop early and you walk the rest of the way. Little things, little, and that's, little that's steps. Really tweaks, isn't it? It tweaks little steps. Yeah, All I think different. we often, when we're trying to change a habit or instill a new one, we kind of go from zero to a thousand yeah, or a million. To be that, set little achievable, easy goals to reach. Yeah, and, and basic stuff. We're talking about movement vegetables yeah you know? know we're not talking about complicated systems or structures but it is important just break it all down what can I do this week that's going to make what am I going to focus on this week is it going to be that 10 minutes at lunchtime I'm going to try and get a little walk at 10 minutes each day and when you start doing it every day because then it becomes the habit and then you think well what else can I do what other little change can I make what one new vegetable can I put in my basket this week that I haven't tried before oh I like that I'll keep eating it little easy achievable steps one at a time lead to much bigger changes overall and then what about staying hydrated and drinking water and so on Caroline mm -hmm. so that's obviously part of the system it is, well. absolutely nutrition also includes hydration and hydration doesn't have to just be water I have clients who don't even like water herbal teas fruit teas very diluted cordials you've got to watch the sugar but if someone really dislikes water a very diluted cordial is better than none at all put lemon or orange or mint or something in water to flavor it and make it more palatable but we need the hydration we should be consuming about two liters of fluid a day it's okay to have a little bit of tea and coffee but tea and coffee is stimulating to the adrenal system so it can create a stress response they are slightly diuretic so we need more of the hydrating fluids and aiming for about two liters overall so how do they stimulate stress or yeah you know, it's the caffeine it's yeah. the caffeine and some people go well I have the decaf ones but there are other chemicals in these things or chemicals used to take out the caffeine that can also have negative impact but if you're having normal tea and coffee including green tea people don't realize this about green tea they contain caffeine and caffeine is a stimulant so they stimulate the adrenal glands the adrenal glands will release adrenaline and cortisol they so it's a stress response on the body so wow. if you're the sort of person who's constantly making a cup of tea and coffee and drinking them throughout the day, you're constantly creating that stress response in the body on top of our external stresses. So it's just being a little bit aware of that and trying to gradually cut down if you do drink a lot. Again, small steps, one at a time. Don't go cold turkey. It doesn't need to be cold turkey. I do like a cup of two a coffee a day but just try slowly reduce it down and introduce some herbal teas a bit more water is the thing to do yeah I, I did not know that about tea and coffee and the stress response mm. and I mean you should see people at work oh I know have one coffee yeah. after the other after the other I know well they're running on it it's what we call running on adrenaline you know and it's if you took that away their body would probably just go <gasps> you know stop <laughs> hope yeah but that's what surely that's worrying because at some point it is going to be taken away and the body won't cope the what yes potentially yeah potentially it won't cope very well if you just that's why you shouldn't go cold turkey with something like that just slowly try to make changes and make other changes to try and alleviate stress and things in the body yeah and the other thing I was wondering about is 
does our gut and all of this what we're talking about the hydration and the whole body working together like we're talking about in a way impact our behavior as well caroline like if i snap at somebody obviously that's my bad somewhere but can it be driven by yeah, by our diet obviously so we know we know there's it was sort of talk about the gut first of all there's a gut brain link there's no question we've got this enteric nervous system direct gut brain link they're communicating with each other so what's going on in the gut can influence our mood but what we're eating can influence our ability to cope with stress. Could be a stressor, but it influences our ability to cope with stress. We need to eat in a way to keep our blood sugar levels stable. If our blood glucose is ro roller coasting up and down throughout the day, it can make us more snappy and more moody, irritable. We won't be able to cope necessarily with these stresses that, as we've said, are, are there and present too much of the time so if we can find a way to eat to stabilize our blood sugar it keeps us on a more even keel of course we're always going to have the odd occasion it's a bit overloaded you know the stresses but it definitely helps us cope better with stress mm. and then I suppose frequency as well I, I'm just thinking about myself you know and <laughs> I have to eat breakfast there is just no way I can get through my day and then lunch as well is always really important for me and I can remember working in an office where people would put a meeting in at lunchtime <laughs> you know the yeah. typical lunch time <laughs> and and I would turn up with my lunch and yeah. say to them you know, people might be a bit annoyed, like, why are you bringing your lunch? And I said, well, it's either I eat this or I eat you. <laughs> yeah. Because I you really eat it. Because food. your blood, because your blood sugar, your glucose levels are beginning to drop and your body's telling you. So if we eat in the correct way, there isn't one ideal way, but typically we need to make sure we're eating more protein, more good fats, and not too many of the starchy and refined carbohydrates. Helps to keep our blood gl glucose on a more even keel, and also the good vegetables and things as well. If we eat that way, then we should be able to go from breakfast to lunch and from lunch to dinner without snacking in between. But that point of feeling a bit like, oh, it's because your blood glucose are beginning to drop. So if you, if you haven't eaten since breakfast, then that's completely understandable. If we're having to constantly get a snack to keep us going, to keep our energy levels up, or because you feel a little bit irritable or whatever, or concentration's going, that's normally because the main meals are not balanced in order to drive this stable blood glucose. There is a way to achieve that. That's what we should be able to achieve. And I'm the same. I like my breakfast. I like to eat breakfast. Some people don't. There's a lot of research to say time restricted eating and having not say every day, but having some days where you don't eat breakfast. Well, it might you might be at breakfast and lunch and you skip the dinner, but having this extended even a 16 hour period when you don't eat is actually considered good from a health and longevity point of view there is research to show that maybe a couple of times a week it doesn't have to be every day I like my breakfast so I'm not planning to give that up anytime soon but I can miss the odd day day here and there when I don't have breakfast but I love breakfast <laughs> <laughs> it's also your habit and you get used to what works for you and that's what I always feel is I I'm, I know what works for me, you know, yes. my sleeping pattern, my eating pattern. And if I go away from that, then things start to go. Ah, ah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, absolutely. Mm. And and that's back again to what you talked about earlier on almost, isn't it? Tracking things and, and, and listening to your body and having that understanding. Yeah. Absolutely. And when we're in an office and we're working, it's trying to be a little bit organized as well. I, you know, as I work, I worked in corporate for 20 years. I used to when I was cooking my dinner the night before, I'd made myself a salad to take to work and I put my fork by the front door because my salad is in the fridge and the fork's by the front door to remind me to pick up the salad when I'm off on my way to work. So it's trying to be a little bit organised and it does take a little bit of time and a little bit of planning to do that. Otherwise, we get to the office or we're working, walking to the office and we're straight in to buy something and it's a sandwich and you know what I mean? We're just then picking it on, we're then buying a coffee and we're grabbing a Mars bar and that's when the bad habits come in it does need a little bit of organization and planning and yeah listening to the body but trying to get into these this sort of healthier mindset we need to take time for ourselves we don't always do that 
Mm. And I find if I plan the night before what I'm going to eat the next day, like breakfast, lunch and dinner, absolutely, it avoids having to make the decisions the next day. Indeed. And also it just you just do it then <laughs> yeah. I mean almost we're almost not quite but almost planning certainly for evening meals the week ahead then you're shopping for it and some of those things will be things that are coming from the freezer because we've cooked and we've cooked enough so we've got some things that are in the freezer so for those days when you're ultra busy you know you've got something healthy in the freezer that you can get out the night before whether it might be a vegetarian dish I might have cooked it could be a piece of salmon that's really easy to wrap in tin foil and you put it in the oven and then you cook vegetables and there's your meal but you know always so you're not caught out that's yeah, the thing. that's the thing not getting caught out and what about cravings then you know people crave not just sugar I found at times I crave eggs or <laughs> that's I crave thing bananas you know. and yeah. things like that and is that again just tuning into your body probably yeah I mean most people are saying they crave sugars or they crave salted crisps or something like that and craving eggs I think that's fantastic if you crave an egg but that sounds like you're very tuned in with your body and you know craving an egg is great I'll have eggs today they're great foods so yeah that's tuning in with your body but if you're craving the sugars part of that is habit and part of it if it's happening between meals on the sugar front it's because your blood sugar levels are dropping too low mm -hmm. Wow. So look, all of this wraps up into this fantastic, holistic, well-being view. And we hear so much now, I think, about well-being in the workplace. And I don't think of it involving nutrition, but it clearly does. It so absolutely does. Yeah, it absolutely does. And are people learning that Caroline is that something that you help people with for example yeah it is so I've done many talks over the years and workshops and gone into companies to deliver workshops on different topics whether it's eating in a way to help you cope with stress stress resilience including lifestyle and factors and how to breathe properly and yeah all those sort of things how it can help with concentration and more and more companies are recognizing the importance that the well-being of staff is so important not just so they perform well because you perform better if you eat better but people are also going to, so they're going to be more productive they're going to be happier they're going to be healthier they're going to cope better with stress less likely to take time off work with stress and the individuals employees like it because they can take that information and carry it through to their home life as well whether it's just for themselves whether it's for their families so it's a win-win for everybody so I've been approached by quite a big company. I'm going in to deliver a series of workshops. So it's, I think as people have certainly begin to transition back into the workplace, I know these things can be done online, but I think there's more of a move. There's a more of a recognition that well-being and nutrition is really fundamental to our health and how well we perform at work and the stress, et cetera. Yeah. And also it's tackling the underlying causes rather than treating the symptoms Absolutely. I mean I think healthy nutrition does that for you doesn't it well I really love to give talks to explain I've only given a few little insights to some of my knowledge today but when people start to have this understanding about how to eat how to put meals together how this influences blood sugar levels how it helps us cope with stress and our energy and our concentration it's it's quite a mind opener for people and then they, they're really excited and they want to go shopping and they want to like oh go and buy some oily fish or try new vegetables or whatever it may be and it doesn't have to be difficult that's what I like to say to people it can be really easy doesn't have to be complicated and that's that's what we all need easy not complicated Absolutely. and Caroline, your, your website is full of resources as well. There's some great blogs and you do that. I think you make it easy for people to understand Thank you. what they can do. So maybe how do people connect with you? T tell us about your website and how. So, so my, my name, uh, surname, Caroline Payton, surname spelt P-E-Y-T-O-N, it's a bit unusual. So my principles, my website, having Payton Principles, Natural Health, 
Facebook page, Patient Principles Natural Health, the same with your Instagram. You can reach out to me either through my website or my email address is caroline at patentprinciples.com. Love to hear from anybody. I'm always love to have a chat, no obligation chat with me if anyone's interested in either hearing how I can help in the workplace or help individuals. Love to have a chat with people. Fantastic. Well, that's been so informative and going to work every day we often just I think don't think about nutrition and that could be the answer to a lot of stuff that's going on in our lives or certainly an eye into (laughs) what's happening and maybe a way of changing habits for the better yeah just trying to help sort of kickstart people onto sort of healthier eating patterns um, can make such a huge difference to how people are feeling and their health overall yeah brilliant well thank you for that caroline thank you for your time today it's lovely to talk to you and to you thank you okay bye now bye imagine if every day you enjoy work express yourself fully and exceed expectations I believe we're all entitled to have this and that the future of work life will be changed by those who strive for and create more fulfilling work lives for themselves, their colleagues, their teams and wider organisation. Thank you for listening today and if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and share it with someone you know who is curious like you.